The prime goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority. And in order to do that, you've got to fragment the majority so they really can't get together and do very much. And you have to concentrate power in the wealth of the nation. Michael Malice, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us, by far, my most notorious guest yet, Lauren Southern, who is a journalist, filmmaker, um, provocateur. Would you call yourself a provocateur? That one works, yeah. Okay, so you have been kicked out of Britain. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. have almost recently, as of what, yesterday, they were going to question whether to allow you into Australia. Yes, and for the last month, I thought I was banned from New Zealand as well, but I just got a very strange apology letter like two days ago saying, you know what, everything we said in our last letter was wrong. And I think it's because of social pressure, people really underestimate the amount of power they have when they actually stand up to their governments and contact their representatives. But we've been having impossible trouble getting my Australia visa. It's like been waiting for 10 weeks we've been getting all these loopholes to jump through and then an impossible time with new zealand who told me if i showed up at an airport there i would basically just be detained and shipped out of the country i would not be allowed to enter uh and then suddenly as soon as we made some of this stuff public and there was a ton of people contacting the representatives and saying this is wrong bam bam allowed in new zealand allowed in australia so what? yeah i mean it, it, it's really – so one of the things as a libertarian, whenever people ask me questions on Twitter and a lot of times they feel they have a right to get a response from me, which they of course don't. Being an author, you know, you write emails to editors or agents and they're not going to reply to you. You don't expect a reply. And when they ask me a question, they try to be provocative. My response, which is a very American libertarian response, is I just write, am, am I being detained? Meaning I don't need to give you an answer. You have – but you actually have been – detained. Now, how would you characterize your political philosophy? I would say that I am a nationalist for the okay. most part politically, but um, it, it's so funny. I, I just consider myself really how I got into this all is I just look at, I observe things in the world and I say what is true. And that's, that's where this all started for me. There's that awesome C.S. Lewis quote where he says, Anyone who bothers about originality in art, culture, or, uh, or writing is almost never original. But nine times, out, nine times out of ten, if you just choose to tell the truth, you'll find yourself being very original. And I just try to tell the truth, and apparently that's an absurd, bizarre thing to do these days, which puts me in the extreme circles of politics. But yeah, really, I'm, I observe the world and I say, hey, unfortunately, we can't have open borders because... Our economies will collapse. We won't be able to uh, support these people with our welfare systems. There'll be cultural problems. Hey, uh, feminism, all of your notions about men and women being exactly the same. That's just objectively not true. So I'd say I just like to tell the truth. Um, but but here's the other thing. But uh, at a, you and I travel in somewhat similar circles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're Canadian. You're, you're uh, WASP. Are you? Is that your ethnicity? Wasp? No, I'm. Well, my background, my family came from Denmark. Okay, but I guess yeah, they're yeah. they're Protestant. Right. So, so I'm I'm a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Jewish immigrant from the Soviet Union. So you and I kind of occupy, and, and I live in New York. We occupy different spheres. So one of the issues mm -hmm. I always struggle with is, at what point am I not comfortable hanging out with someone or associating with someone? Right. And there are points where I'm like, you know what, this is not cool for me at the same time i don't ever feel the need to make a public spectacle and denounce somebody it's just like i just won't start hanging out with them how do you personally make that criterion now what, what do you mean i i need you to talk in less vague terms are you talking about like hey talk i don't want to hang out with this muslim who wants to cause terrorism or are you talking hey i don't want to talk about this person talk with this person who uh is is like a race realist. Like, I, I'm not sure. sure. I, I, what I mean specifically. Just radicals in general. Yeah, I mean, like, if I have friends who, if, if the, the kind of views that they have at a certain point, I'm like, you know what? I don't feel like I could comfortably integrate you into my social circle. Uh, at a certain point, it's just like, I'm just not comfortable with this. 
Hmm. I will, this is the thing, I will hang out with anyone. I will have political conversations with anyone. And that goes for people who extremely disagree with me. The only issue I find with people that are on the far left circles is they tend to get violent. Otherwise, sure. I would spend a lot more time with far leftists. Some of my very close friends are uh, rather left wing. But certainly uh, in, in this circle, it does the, the very, very far right circles. I do know some people in there. I have talked to them before. But for the most part, like a, a lot of the far alt right that people get angry about online that are like posting swastikas and stuff, you don't meet those people in real life. I don't. I don't know anyone like that in person. I've never met any Ku Klux Klan members myself. For the most part, the nationalists I meet are like, generation identity guys who advocate peaceful protests against the mass immigration into their countries. Uh, some people that dabble in uh, white identity politics, for sure, I, I've spoken to and met, but as long as someone isn't advocating violence, as long as someone's not firing up gas chambers, I have no problem having a conversation with people. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just mean, like, here, here's what exactly specific what I'm thinking of. When I was at Charlottesville, you know, when I was there, I was talking to Pax Dickinson, right? And he sure. got invited to a party by, I think it was the right stuff. And they told him, don't bring the Jew. Okay. And if someone doesn't want to hang out with Jews, I am I'm have to be fine with it because they're not going to want to hang out with me. But at a certain point, it's like, is, is if someone who I'm friends with is friends with such a person, do you know what I mean? Like, where do you so for you do you just saying i don't care what they think as long as they're amiable i i've never had myself get in that predicament okay i don't know it's it's very that's very strange to me but the thing is too that i'm very small with my social circles circles okay. i don't hang out with a lot of the people in the online sphere in real life i have kind of normal family and friends that uh i don't have to deal with someone saying don't bring the jew but if someone said that to me i i kind of look at them and say okay you want me to have a reasonable conversation with you but you're not willing to sit down and have a reasonable conversation with someone because of their ethnicity like come on like i'm i'm here for open and reasonable debate i'm willing to give people who are in the white nationalist circles, uh, a, a chance to an open dialogue. And if they don't want to give that to other people, then I'm probably going to push back at okay. them for that. Okay. Tell me, so l the first, I think, of, of your original reporting that kind of went wide was going to the migrant camp in Calais, France, right? Yeah. How did you make your way there? And what is it that you saw there that I think most people aren't privy to seeing? Because very few people, I think, actually go to places like this firsthand. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know like how all that started. I, I hadn't I wasn't working for Rebel Media yet and I kind of I was actually working as a cocktail waitress at a casino and I decided oh. I'm gonna go to Europe for a month and just try this journalism thing. For some reason it was at the peak of the migrant crisis and no one else was doing it. No one else was reporting on what was actually going on on the ground. I saw a few articles from Breitbart saying these are all men, these aren't women and children. And I said, I'm just gonna ask for a month off work take a break from university and go there myself. So I did that. I took what little money I had on my bank account, went there myself. Rebel paid for the flights, but I paid for everything else and uh, traveled there with the cameraman and went on the ground. And th this is, I think, a big testament to anyone can do journalism. Anyone can go to the ground and check it out because I didn't have huge backing when I did that. But when I got there, we, <laughs> we actually took an Uber to the Calais camp and the Uber that picked us up was a Tesla. So it was really awkward driving up in a Tesla Uber into this migrant camp with all these guys staring at the car. And immediately when I stepped out, the police came up to us and said, you're not allowed past this point. You're not allowed past this point. Um, we, we asked why. They said it's going to be too dangerous for you. Apparently, all of these women and children, poor refugees, uh, are too dangerous for us to walk in and go talk to. But we said, we're fine. So they let us go. And when we walked in, it was but literally just immediately hundreds of men on their cell phones, hundreds of guys, none of them from Syria, walked around the whole camp, asked over, over I think 200 times, where are you from? And only one person said Syria to me, only one person. And this was when every single news report was saying women and children from Syria stuck in a camp in France. And it was at that moment that it just kind of clicked. Holy crap, the news just reports whatever the heck they want. They, they literally will just write whatever they want. It doesn't matter what's true. 
like I've got articles right now referring to my Australia stuff saying I'm permanently banned and they're coming out after it's been publicly, everyone knows that I'm not banned. People just write anything that will get clicks. It's, it's nuts. It was the complete opposite of the truth on the ground in Calais. Michael Malice here. I want to tell you about our first sponsor, which are Le Barbier de Bourbon Clean Shampoo, which are at shavecleanmaintain.com. If you go to shavecleanmaintain.com, you get a full range of shaving gear. They've got the beard oil. They've got the shampoo. They've got the aftershave. Personally, I use the shaving foam. You take a little bit on your fingers, uh, run it on your face, and changes shaving from an ordeal to a fun ritual that you could do every day, and it's got a nice, sophisticated sandalwood scent. I highly recommend using this stuff for better grooming that'll leave you feeling more confident and like a grown-up. Take that shaving stuff you get at the supermarket, throw in the trash, and if you go to shavecleanmaintain.com and use promo code you're welcome, you get free shipping on your first order. Shavecleanmaintain.com, you're welcome. So he here's one of the arguments I often have with conservatives. Do you think this is a function of uh, members of the press being lazy? Or do you think it's a function of them intentionally misrepresenting the truth in order to put forward an agenda? I think it's both. I think that for the most part, people don't realize what journalists are. We give way too much respect to journalists in our society. They, we, we think they're there to tell us the objective, unbiased truth. But in a lot of cases, it's either some pretentious liberal elite that's gotten this cool job at uh, Vice and they're super excited about it so they just want to give the narrative that their boss wants which is refugee children in Europe need to be saved so they'll write that to appease their boss or it's some guy in his basement with Cheetos in his belly button that's just looking at foreign news stories mm. waiting for something that will get lots and lots of clicks and traffic so that they can get advertiser money and in both of those cases you're going to be telling a little bit of lies to to get traffic and or, or you're going to be making it curating a story for whoever your donors are of your news site whether that be aj plus which is funded by the qatari government or the bbc which is funded by the british government you know these all of these news sites have different interests sometimes it's malicious sometimes it's laziness sometimes it's uh whoever's funding the project what do you think that's been written about you in the press because i mean all, all these are there's so many articles that matter of factly ascribe all sorts of views to you what do you think about has have they gotten the most wrong uh have they gotten the most wrong yeah. any person that has tweeted out and these are journalists these are uh twitter verified people anyone who has tweeted out that i open fired on drowning refugees in the mediterranean i mean that's just not true that's not even a little bit true it's it's shocking to me that i still see this kind of stuff it was actually will sommer from the hill that started that rumor he saw a picture of me holding a flare Wait, and it's, hold on it's not a if it's something's tweeted out it's not even a rumor it's a claim yeah it's yeah, a claim i yeah, suppose yeah yeah, so he said, allegedly, Lauren has been detained by the Italian Coast Guard for shooting flares at migrant boats. I don't know where he got that. No one knows where he got that story. He just made it up out of thin air. And then I was getting calls from the Associated Press asking me if I was firing, basically, people have literally reported I was firing torpedoes at migrant boats. Jesus. It, it's like that game of... Uh, Oh, telephone. telephone. Yeah. Where you whisper in someone's ear and it keeps going. And then by the end of it, I'm torpedoing drowning babies and puppies. <laughs> and what really happened was we just drove a boat beside a NGO boat that was legally trafficking people and protested it. And I held up a little flare for light. It didn't fire. It wasn't a gun. It, I could literally hold it in my hand. That's right. how non-lethal or dangerous it was. The Italian Coast Guard let us go right away. It's... Uh, yeah, just completely ridiculous. Actually, apparently there was just a New Zealand radio station that was saying Stefan Molyneux and I were Holocaust deniers. So that's cool. We're going to have to look into that one. <laughs> but they just make up things constantly, and I don't have time to keep up with it. I have to is turn the, my it, alerts off. Is, is the preferred term Holocaust skeptic? Holocaust skeptic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Revisionist. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, I don't understand how you can... I mean, explain to me how you can kind of laugh this off because I've had things where people things have been written about me that are certainly aren't on this scale. Uh, the one most recently, Vanity Fair called me a conservative, and I had to you know email her, and it, it it's like. For me, part of it is trying to reverse engineer how did this person get to this conclusion, but it's also jarring to see things in black and white 
being said about you that you know aren't true. So how? I mean, you're young. You're 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 Canadian. So Canadians are are nice as a rule. Uh, certainly nicer than Americans. How is it? Does this not get to you? Well, it got to me at first, at the beginning, uh, when I did my anti-feminism activism and people were saying I was screaming at rape survivors that they deserved it, just made that up and tons of people believed it. I had family and friends, uh, not family, but friends that were contacting me from high school saying, I can't believe you did this. And at the beginning, it really gets to you because you have, you still have this uh, idea that everyone's opinion around you matters. Certainly if you haven't been online popular and viral when you're at school when you're in your community you see those people every day those opinions affect your life they affect your dating life they affect your relationship with your sure. family so you uphold everyone's opinions really high but you kind of have to get a natural process and learn how to deal with it when there's hundreds of thousands of people talking about you every day because really that one troll in Timbuktu they aren't going to impact your life they're not a part of your direct community and sure. you really have to learn to focus in and decide whose opinions are valuable. If a highly respected uh, conservative voice were to say that I were torpedoing NGOs, I'd be a little upset. If my father were to say that, if my friends that were close to me were to say that, I'd be upset because I've learned to respect their opinion. Um, you know, it does, it affects me a tiny bit. I just had a friend that I wanted to visit and their mother was telling them, don't hang out with that girl because she's a terrorist. And that kind of stuff gets to me, especially in the dating world. It makes dating a little difficult when guys' parents Google me and find out all of this nonsense and read all these fake articles. Uh, but other than that, for the most part, they're, they're telling lies. I know what I've actually done. I know who I actually am. My family and friends and the people closest to me and the people who actually bother to take the time to look into what I've done know who I am. And those people, I, I respect their opinions far more than the people who just make up a judgment off of fake news. Sure, but it's it's very few people who are going to take the time. Uh, you know, whenever mm -hmm. you meet someone, I'm sure nine times out of 10, you're not going to be Googling them and doing the deep search, right? So I'm thinking about things like Sarah Sanders being not allowed in at the Red Hand. And not only was she not allowed the red in at the Red Hand restaurant, they followed her group to the next restaurant to further berate her. Just last week, uh, the guy from the walkaway viral campaign on Twitter, like he got kicked out of a, fo a photo store, just came up to him and said, leave. I know uh, Chadwick Moore uh, got kicked out of his favorite gay bar for supporting Trump. I mean, it's, I think it's much, I'm not trying to mess with your head, but as a female, no. I would think this is something that would be even scarier when people have that social freedom to be confrontational in person. Um, I mean, has that happened to you yet? And if not, don't you think it's a matter of time? And how would you, how, how do you expect to, to get ready for that? Yes, I have had people be confrontational in person. Of, of course, if I'm ever at protests, I've had someone poured fox urine on me in new oh, york geez. actually that was pretty gross and it was kind of scary at first too because i was like what is this substance yeah, i don't yeah. know what it is it could be an acid attack right Luck i was lucky though um i've had people yell at me in the streets people call me fascist bitch whatever and i it just the thing is i've really learned how to deal with it now it doesn't the only time it affects me is if it's people that i respect the only time it affects me is if it's close friends. That's the time it really gets to me. I'm a, Australia is going to be a little strange. I've got a speaking tour coming up there and there's about 3,000, 4,000 protesters just in one city I know that have signed up for the event and they've got posters all over the city calling me a, a fascist, saying that Stefan Molyneux is friends with the KKK. So these just crazy claims, uh, which is going to cause for a lot of animosity, but we'll have security there. So We'll we'll figure it out. It's just you, you have to learn to live with it. And I, my life could be so much worse. <laughs> there there could be people out there not trying to vindicate me. You know. I mean, just point out to them the KKK was very much exclusively an American phenomenon. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. You'll be all set there. Um, <laughs> but I I mean, let's talk about being detained in the UK. Because, I mean, again, for someone like me from the Soviet, being born in the Soviet Union, to have the government kind of ha hold you captive for any period of time might be one of my biggest fears. So tell me that whole story. What happened there? 
Sure. So I was coming in uh, on a bus from, uh, oh, where was I? I was in Belgium and I was busing to the UK, to London. And when we were taking the passage from Calais, I got stopped and they asked me to take all of my luggage off the bus. And I was like, oh, okay, they're going to ask me a few questions. And then oh, So you knew that they, like an- they, they singled you out. This wasn't some random thing already you knew well i i knew when i gave them my passport and they asked me to take my luggage off Got the bus it. at that point i was like okay yeah they're Got singling it. me out and this was right after my friends martin selner and Brittany pettibone were just banned from the country so i kind of had an inkling of an idea i was like oh darn am i going to be banned too and after after the bus had long gone i'm like okay <laughs> i might be here a while they put me in a detention center uh they they told me to stay there until wait, wait, the police hold on. Could come. what's a de- detention center look like i mean what were the accommodations okay how do i how do i describe it it's kind of like you know like classrooms and high school classrooms they've got kind of that ugly ceiling it's yeah. very almost medical looking it was kind of gross they had like a bed those like workout mats on the ground to sleep on um they have a like guard area where they're watching you through like bulletproof glass and then there's like a Quran and a Bible that you can look at and they've got tons of uh, they've got tons of stuff in Arabic because I see most of the people that are detained in Calais are illegal migrants like going from the Calais jungle and trying to go to London so they had tons of stuff in Arabic they offered me some curry <laughs> and were I just kind of sat there were you by yourself in this center yeah I was by myself at okay. least, but you could be detained and held with other people in that okay. center so I was just kind of lying on one of the mats and I was reading uh, the Bible while waiting. And they had already asked me a couple of questions when they were taking my luggage off the bus. They brought me in. They asked to see my speech that I was giving in Belgium. They read through that. It was just on uh, Flemish nationalism. They uh, asked me if I knew Tommy Robinson. And then they said, OK, uh, we're done. Go back to the detention center. And where it got weird, I was wait, just wait, Were they friendly? Me- what was their attitude like? Were they hostile? At the beginning, they were friendly, and then it got kind of weird when the police came in because they came in and the border control said, we're handing you over to the police now, the Kent police. And this is where it all got weird because they gave me a pamphlet and they were like, just so you know, just so you know your rights, we are detaining you under the Terrorism Act 2000, Schedule 7. And I I was just sitting there in this detention center looking at this document like I am being detained as a terrorist right now. What is going on? This is not what I expected. This is not what happened to Brittany and Martin. There are four cops surrounding me and they're telling me I am going to be questioned. Wait, as a at this point, so did anyone know where you were? I had, I had, they had taken my phone away, but I had just texted Brittany okay. uh, that I had been detained at the border. So she, all she had done is tweeted out, Lauren is detained at the border. No one okay. knows that I'm being questioned as a terrorist at okay. this point. Uh, no one knows uh, what's going on with me. How scared were you? It's like at this four a.m. It's like four a.m. in okay. <laughs> in France too. I wasn't scared, but as soon as I got the terrorism thing, I was sweating bullets. Yeah. I was like, I know I'm not a terrorist. And this is what I was thinking. I was like, what meme? What <laughs> meme are they going to pull out of my Facebook archives okay. to accuse me of terrorism? Okay. What? Because uh, you know, people people post memes all of the course. time about like oh, let's block this or that. And we're just joking. Mm-hmm. And I assumed like Zuckerberg had sold them my whole phone history. And so we're walking, they're taking me to a private room. And while we're walking, they're saying, give us your phone code. You need to give us your phone code right now. And I said, I will tell you anything, but there is no way in hell I'm giving you my phone code. Good. And they, yeah. So they brought me in. Wait, hold on. Let me interrupt room. you because let me just make two more points. Because a lot of conservatives yeah. in America are very big on defending what the CIA did with terrorism of like uh, in, in Gitmo and, and, you know, torturing people who are, are, you know, quote unquote, legally regarded as terrorists. And the point I made is there's half the people in America who are perfectly happy right now, including Michael Ian Black does this every day, literally every day, uh, saying that NRA members are terrorists. So if you are going yeah. to allow the government to literally torture terrorists, it's going to take one administration until that applies to virtually everyone. So that's very yeah. – sli- you are the example of the slippery slope. You obviously aren't plotting to kill anyone. Let's suppose your views are extremely inflammatory, evil, so on and so forth. You are still clearly not uh, advocating blowing up the Eiffel Tower or anything like that. So it's, it's kind of very scary that people don't put two and two together, number one. Number two is – this is a great moment in terms of people ask about fighting for freedom, and I always point to technology is going to be what saves us. The fact that they had to ask you 
for your code and you could say no and they couldn't do anything about it as opposed to five years ago, they can call Apple or whatever your company was and Apple would happily provide it. Apple has made it so even Apple can't help the police. This is a great step forward in protecting people's privacy. Well, here's what people have to understand too. This is the funny part because when I refused to give it to them, they started to threaten me. They said, okay, if you don't give us your code, what we're going to do is you are going to end up being held for longer. We're going to take your fingerprints. We're going to take a mugshot. We're going to confiscate your phone for a week and our hackers are going to get into it and you're going to be in far more trouble and detained for far longer if you don't just give it to us now. And I said, I told them, I looked at them and I said, I don't believe that. Oh, I don't believe that yeah. for a second. Because I know that even the actual terrorist phones, the iPhones that they got in America, they couldn't get in those for years. Yeah, They couldn't get the, the codes. Yeah. So I, I, I discovered that it was a bluff. The yeah. police were bluffing, fake threatening me to try and get me to give them their fo my phone and, code. And here's what else people don't realize. The cops can lie to you as much as they want. They have no, yeah. there's no, they're not under oath. And even when they're on another road, they could get perfectly happy pretending this never happened. And by the way, I, I guess they're, I'm sure your code is one, two, three, four, and they just should have tried <laughs> Something like that, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They actually got really uh, embarrassed because I, I was kind of bantering. I, after I had spent 10 minutes sweating and I realized that they were bluffing, right. and that they didn't really have anything, I kind of started playing a little bit. I was like, why do you guys want to see my nudes so bad? Yeah. <laughs> I was just joking, but they got really defensive. They were like, we are very respectful. We are, da -da -da -da. they got super defensive. It was really funny, but they, we kind of got into a nice banter. And, and here's the other thing. We're if, joking. If, if they're saying that they have a pretense to detain you, if they want to be dicks, they'll do it. Even if you gave them the code. Yeah. So this yeah. is, it doesn't make sense even on its face. Because now they have a perfect excuse. Be like, oh, we need to get your phone hacked. We don't trust you're going to give us the code. You're going to be here for a week. So they're full of crap. And the idea that th that they want to make their job easier on themselves. No, if it's going to be harder, it's going to, you're the one who's going to have to suffer, not them. They're getting paid yeah. regardless. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, go ahead. Now, under Schedule 7, this is the very interesting thing about it, is for the first hour, I have no right to, I can't plead the fifth. I have no right to remain silent. Oh. So I, and not only that, I have no right to a solicitor. So they wow. can just question me and I have no right to legal advice. That's why in the phone thing, I, it was just like banter back and forth. It wasn't me saying, contact my lawyer. It was me just by myself with three cops questioning did you me. Know, at a and it's, did you know it was an hour? Sorry, time? Did you know you had that hour window? Uh, I was no, I found a lot of this out uh, after later. Fact. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I still like, oh, so I, I demanded a solicitor immediately and they told me we can get you a solicitor after the first hour. Okay. And, and that, so I didn't know that. Yeah. We were in like a very tiny hot room as well. And they put this giant recording device on the table, like almost like a, <laughs> a giant police recording device. It felt like a movie, really. Yeah. I'm in there with, with these three cops and they're questioning me and uh, asking me to say my name, date of birth, everything. Now, here's what people need to understand during that first hour is we'll get to the bizarre questions they asked me, but they also went and they called my father at some point through all this because I asked them to let my parents know where I was. And my father recorded the phone call. I don't think they were expecting him to, but okay. he did. And on that phone call, they said, your daughter has been detained as a terrorist. Of course, my father's freaking the heck out. Oh, of like, course. What's going on? Uh, but throughout it, they said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. We don't suspect her of terrorism. Wow. We have no reason to suspect her of terrorism. Right. So they've said this already. Yet I'm in this questioning room with them. I have no right to remain silent. And they are asking me questions along the lines of, uh, what are your political views? What They asked me, how do you feel about running over people with cars, particularly Muslims? And then they asked me, and, oh, and I told them, I was like, I, I'm not in support of terrorism. And I, I hardly, I also said, I hardly think far-right terrorism is your concern right now and far-right people running over people with cars is your concern at the moment and they said well speaking of how do you feel about far-right terrorism so they're just pushing me asking me these crazy questions like when was the last uh, along the lines of when was the last time you beat your wife type questions right, right. you know and uh I'm, I'm sitting there sweating and it's almost become uh, it's inevitable to sweat because it's such a small hot room. So everything I say looks nervous and like I'm lying. But mm. it, it got to a point where it was so ludicrous and ridiculous. I was finding myself laughing at the questions they were asking me. And it, it got to a point where the adrenaline kind of kicks in and I'm no longer afraid. I'm just 
I can't believe this is my life. I can't believe it's five in the morning and I'm in the Calais jungle being questioned if I'm going to run Muslims over with cars. <laughs> and I'm sure you're also loopy. It's, you've got no sleep at a certain point. You can't even accept the reality. Yeah. It's like, this is surreal. Yeah. So I, I, I actually had a decent amount of fun with it after I had gotten over the, after I kind of realized they didn't have any like memes on me right. <laughs> and they actually couldn't get in my phone and my father had been contacted i was able to have a little bit of fun with it i was like you guys can't do anything with me i know i'm innocent the worst you can do for me to me is ban me from the country which they did so did they tell you on the, t so, at the right right away they're like you can't go to U the uk so after uh an hour and a bit of questioning i kept demanding a solicitor kept demanding a solicitor and they called the UK and the UK for some reason refused me one. They couldn't get me one. So the questioning period, they uh, I was waiting in the room for like half an hour, 40 minutes. I, I can't remember the exact times. And they're just trying to get me a solicitor. They're not able to ask me any more questions at this point. Uh, so me and the cop, he was actually quite nice. We were just sitting in there talking about our favorite bands and, <laughs> and movies and TV shows. Um, and then they come back, they ask me a few more questions and say, all right, we're sending you back to the detention center until we can find you a solicitor. Uh, go back to the detention center, sit around for a few hours. They come back and they've got a letter and they say, okay, you're free to go. Okay. I've got, I get this letter and the letter says you have been banned permanently from the United Kingdom for racism. And my racist act was handing out flyers that said Allah is a gay god. That's a totally different story. It was for a social experiment. Uh, but I don't know what Allah or being gay has to do with race. Apparently it's racist, but they had banned me permanently uh, for, for being racist. And so they took me from there. Uh, they took me to a processing center, drove me in a little cop car around. And this was the one of the craziest parts is after sitting in this processing center, also a detention center, they walked me to the border of Calais or the border. So they have a border uh, for England, basically, right. and France on Calais. They took me to the border and the guy that was walking me didn't speak English. And I kept being like, hey, where are you taking me? Where are we going? And then he takes me to this giant gate the huge border wall, opens the door, points me out. I take my luggage and walk to the other side. He says au revoir and closes the gate. And I'm literally in the middle of the morning. It's like you know, middle, middle of nowhere looking around. I've been locked out of a country. They didn't give me any advice where to go. My flight is in the UK. I, I couldn't call an Uber. My phone was almost dead. So I walked for an hour until I found a McDonald's. Wait, this is <laughs> so you're in France on French soil. Yeah, I'm in France. My okay. flight is in the UK. My friends are in the UK. I'm all alone. It's first thing in the morning. I haven't slept all night. And I'm just like, what has just happened? They just locked me out of the border in the middle of nowhere. Michael Malice here to tell you about BetDSI.com. They've been in business for over 20 years, paying winners. It's a top rated on sportsbook review sites with an easy to use mobile playing interface. You play. You win, you get paid. BetDSI.com has a great mobile app. It's easy to use from anywhere. They offer live in-game wagering. You can make plays throughout the entire game and events, and they offer odds on pretty much everything else, including sports, politics, reality TV, pretty much everything. I recommend BetDSI if you want to add a little excitement to the games you're watching. Even if you don't like sports, this is how you have fun watching the World Cup and have the funnest work day of your life. Go to BetDSI.com and use promo code WELCOME100 for a 200% bonus on your initial deposit. That's free money. BetDSI.com, promo code WELCOME100. Here's the big question that I'm sure you've gotten. I know you've been asked this on Twitter many times. Do you see the irony of not being allowed into the UK as being someone who's not for open borders and being personally it's... held? <laughs> no, the thing is, I actually... Like, if you're really being intellectually dishonest, yes, I can see the irony. I can see where the jokes would be. But the reality is I have never in my life advocated for the barring of legal entry to countries, people who speak the language, who love the culture, who have no criminal records, and are just visiting for five days and have a flight out. That's never been something I've okay. advocated against. I'm advocating against illegal entry, people who have terrorism backgrounds, people who want to immigrate and don't speak the language are going to contribute nothing to culture and are going to go on welfare. I am none of those things. So if you want to be extreme, if someone wants to be extremely intellectually dishonest and just make a fancy joke about that, sure, I'll let it go. But the people that are seriously trying to argue that 
I got what I deserve. Very silly and very ignorant of my viewpoints. So, but here's the other thing in terms of loving the culture. Wouldn't you say that a, a large majority of Canadians don't actually love the culture in the same way that you do? Um, are we talking about the UK or are we talking okay, about, I'm talking about Canada? Canada. So I'm saying like, I'm saying what they like about Canada is not what you like. They're, they're trying to push so, Canada in a very different direction than you are. Depends what you define as Canadian. If we're talking about since the seventies, if, if we're talking about what Canada was founded on as a country and not what it's become, I think a lot of people would agree with me. Canadians never had a choice to have state enforced multiculturalism. Canadians never got to vote on mass immigration. And when they're actually polled, the majority of Canadians, when they're given the research on mass immigration, want less immigration. So it's the people that run the media, it's recent migrants, and it's uh, our politicians that push this narrative that I'm actually in the minority viewpoint, when I don't believe that's true. And it's factually not true when Canadians are given the data on immigration. But aren't, aren't, isn't the median Canadian far to the left of even the median American, and let alone you personally? Sure, maybe, but they would still, I believe, support free speech for the most part, although that is going down. They would still support democracy for the most part, uh, liberal values. And these are things that are not found in cultures. This is what I don't understand about multiculturalism, is how can, how can you have two different cultures that believe there needs to be two different legal systems coincide in the same country without one culture eventually dominating the other. I don't think liberals know what they're voting for. I don't think if the far left saw the end game of what is actually going to happen when they become the minority, when, uh, when basically the original Canadians become the minority and people come in to an extent that uh, in, in Vancouver where you've got mass Chinese immigration or in Toronto where we do have a lot of Islamic immigration when they become the minority i don't think they're in fact i know for a fact they're not going to support the laws that are introduced and i know for a fact they're not going to like them but they don't know what they're doing yet right now it just looks like beautiful multiculturalism but we're talking about people that have never gone to the calais jungle they probably don't even hang out with uh people in the islamic community most of their they, they say Oh, the only misogynists I met were, are white. The only uh, bad people I meet are white. Well, they only hang out with white people. They only hang out <laughs> in these white liberal circles. And they think they understand the rest of the world, but they don't. They're so ignorant. They're so ignorant of the fact that most other cultures are operating on tribalism. Most other cultures, they do not give a damn about what happens to uh, Canadians. They're fighting for their own culture and their own, even Slavs, even Slavs for the most part are very tribalistic and they're not, uh, uh, in some cases in their communities. Like I find, I find a lot of liberal uh, waspy Canadians are just extremely ignorant of what immigration is doing to the country. But I mean, here, in, like, let me take something you just said. So here in America, we actually do have multiple legal systems, right? We have federal court. Yeah. We have 50 different state courts. We also have private arbitration. Uh, in, in certain communities, you have like Sharia, like if, if it's local matters, you're going to have the Hasidic Jews going to have their own version. I, I don't know if, if the Sikhs do, but they probably have some kind of private arbitration and things like that. And mm -hmm. that is something that it, it works I'm, I'm using word, the word works broadly to the point where most people don't ever have to stop and think about it because you're not actually concerned with multiple legal systems. We have, I mean, you have three political parties, uh, which are, you know, the liberals, you have the new Democrats and you have the conservatives. Isn't that effectively three different cultures? Sure. It's working for now. I mean, Rome, Rome survived for a while while it let barbarians in. Okay. It, it, it's, it's working for now. And people don't realize, though, that we are people who believe in free speech, people who believe in liberal values are quickly becoming a minority. The question is never, does this work now? Of course it works now. I'm able to get on a bus and not be raped by migrant gangs. I'm able to get a job, even though I'm white. I may have some trouble getting into the military or applying to universities, but for the most part, it's fine. But what happens when that the people who believe in liberal values are not the majority. What happens in a case like South Africa, where they've just decided arbitrarily to take away white land without compensation and fire most of the white people from their jobs simply because of their skin color? Not everyone believes in freedom. Not everyone believes in individualism. And uh, I think it's a pipe dream to believe the West, rest of the world 
has the same inherent values as the Western world. They don't, and that is visibly true. And if we want to remain free countries, we have to limit the amount of immigration that comes into our country. We have to limit it to people. It's almost like the hands from an hoppe ideology where he says, you have to, in order to have a libertarian society, you have to have only libertarians in the society. Right. If people don't accept the non-aggression principle in your society, well, they're going to violate it. It doesn't matter. It, 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 it's certainly if you get 60% of people who don't believe in the non-aggression principle. Well, I, so if I, you I, want a Western society, you have to have mostly Westerners in that society. But the thing is, I don't agree that most Westerners really do hold free speech as a value. Like you guys have hate speech laws. Isn't that, isn't, isn't, isn't it, aren't there something, and please correct me because I'm not an expert in Canadian culture, obviously. Isn't it a thing where there's things like hate facts are illegal in Canada that even if something is true, if it's spoken to promote things that are undesirable, you can get prosecuted, correct? Sure, sure. But we can look at we can look at um, who brought in those laws and whether they were voted for by Canadians or whether they were put through by corrupt politicians. The thing is, it's much like the the mass immigration debate. The majority of Canadians did not vote for the levels of immigration we have now. And it, it was just imposed on them. Okay. It wasn't a choice, much like our hate speech laws. We didn't vote on those. Yes, sure. We voted for the politicians that put them in, but we didn't ex we don't expect people don't pay attention to that. They just pick whoever, they, they listen to the propaganda in the media, they look at whatever name and they check the box. They don't think about the long run. It's maybe 10% of people that actually sure. think about the policies that are going to be implemented by these politicians. I do not believe that educated uh, Western, people who grew up in Western value households actually believe in the idea of uh, hate, hate speech laws and mass immigration when they are given the facts. Okay. Yes, I think there was mass ignorance. Yes, I think there was mass indoctrination in our schools. Yes, I think there are a lot of liberal Canadians, and they're far more liberal than Americans. But overall, a lot of those, a lot of the things we're talking about that are the biggest problems were not voted for by Canadians. Sure, but when you talk about educated, like it, I, I, there was a recent poll I'm sure you've seen of like college students uh, in America, and the question was, which is more important, free speech? or you know having a safe space that feature doesn't offend people and the college which is the most educated segment they preferred the latter they given gun you know forced to make a choice free speech was not their highest priority well these are also students we're talking about and sure. what's 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 the quote if you're not a uh, Democrat when you're 20, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative by the time you're 40, you have no brain. Most most people are going to be quite liberal in universities. And it is a problem and it is something that needs to be addressed. And that's even more so an argument for why we don't need more mass immigration because we already have a lot of crazy going on in our universities that we have to deal with. We already have a lot of authoritarian ideologies that are finding themselves growing and festering in our education systems that we need to deal with. Why are we inviting more in? Why are we inviting more problems, more people that are going to have trouble assimilating to a culture that was based on freedom? The problem is not me. I don't want to preserve what we have right now. I want to preserve what has the, the society that we built these nations on, these success, what Canada and America was built on were originally Western ideas. And sure. we are simply surviving off the fumes of greater men at the moment. The only reason these liberals in our society haven't destroyed it is because they are living off the fumes of these greater men. And I want to preserve that. Yes, we have a lot of people trying to destroy it. And yes, some of them did grow up in Western households. But that isn't to say that uh, we should suddenly bring in a ton more problems into our culture, a ton more stuff that undermines our original values. That's really not going to help. Here's what I don't get, though. It's this claim that progressivism, you know, Woodrow Wilson, FDR, uh, you know, you guys had Trudeau's dad and, and all these other people. Are you saying Trude uh, what, progressivism is not an inherently Western idea? No, I'm not saying that. Um, sure. It, it's one it's one side of uh, it, it, it is to an extent that it was created by Westerners, but it is a, an idea that challenges uh, what Western culture. Should it's an be. idea that challenges the what Western culture was founded on. Okay. So it, it's a it's a criticism of Western culture by Westerners. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, of course. It so makes we sense. we have a lot of critics within our culture, for sure. Sure. I, I mean, I think there's this this idea on, on the right a lot of times that like this is some kind of alien, 
uh, kind of uh, ideology that's foreign to us when it's very homegrown. Pat Buchanan talks about this. Like this is as American as apple pie, populism, progressivism, William Jennings Bryan, Woodrow Wilson, FDR. These people were far to the left of Bernie Sanders. Sure, sure. And this is the thing as well, though. Pro progressivism uh, survives and thrives off the idea of people not being nationalistic. And the best way to get rid of nationalism is to import a bunch of people who break up the population and to get rid of the group identity of a nation. Uh, so I think that progressives also, the, the, the progressives that we do have in our society that I think need to be debated with and argued with, there have been plenty of wars of authoritarians and progressives and uh, Marxists within Western culture, but the it is a whole new issue that I think is going to provide prove to be far more bloody and far more scary than the battle of ideas and free speech that we're having right now to invite cultures that are so different from ours into the West. Yes, we've always had a problem with progressives. Yes, we've always had a problem with internal debate and criticism of what the future of our nations should be within the West. And a lot of that is based, though, on the idea that debate should happen, that there should be liberal values. But to bring in someone who believes in Sharia, to bring in uh, people who are very tribalistic and only focus on the success of their own language, their own race, their own culture and heritage, that is going to cause so many uh, inter, uh, inter community wars and battles. We live in a cultural mosaic in Canada here, which means this is only a recent idea, FYI, which means we have co different cultures that stay separate. They are actually supposed to be in their own little regions, which I think is a very silly idea, because what happens when one of those mosaic pieces becomes bigger than the others? What happens when we open our borders and tons and tons of people from China come into Canada and the red part of the mosaic becomes the whole damn picture? It's not going to be a very pretty mosaic anymore and they're going to dominate the culture. And suddenly it's not going to be Canada anymore. Why don't we just become a part of China? If we do not have a unique language, if we do not have a unique culture, if we do not have distinct values from the rest of the world, then why doesn't Canada just join Egypt? Why don't we become a part of Sweden? Why don't we become a part of China? If we aren't going to be a nation with something distinct, there's there's no point in having any damn borders or any damn laws or any damn politicians. Do you? I mean, we don't have a unique language, though. We speak the same language, even though we're not in the same country. It's unique from different countries. So we we say this is a Cana this is a English and French speaking country. You speak English and French here, so and that's why we tend to get along better with Americans. Is because we do have a lot of cultural similarities, which is why I would have far less problem with an American immigrating to Canada than someone from Somalia immigrating to Canada. Let's so Canada is a good example of this, and let's talk about. I, I can't believe I didn't think about this till now. Quebec is a province in Canada. Uh, French is the official language there, and one of the accomplishments of, of uh, was Trudeau's dad was to make, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong in this one, was to make Canada officially a bilingual country. America doesn't have an official language. In Canada, all the labels are both in English and in French, right? Do, do you yeah. not, do you not, so the, the Quebec are very different in many ways from the rest of the Canadians. They pride themselves on this. There's a, a Bloc Quebecois in, in Parliament. They, they, there's a big separatist movement in Quebec. Do you not see this as an example of a functional, uh, if not multicultural, at least dual culture? Is that, is it functional? Because last time I I'm checked, I'm asking you, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, times. I don't know about they, they, so. They've attempted to secede into their own country multiple times. They don't really want to be a part of us. In fact, Trudeau has said himself, Quebecers were simply better than the rest of Canada. There's a tribalistic mindset to Quebec. There's a tribalistic mindset to the French versus the English Canadians. They've got their own radio stations. They've got their own news stations. Uh, if, if you go there and you don't speak French, they'll, they'll give you, they'll look down on you, right? It's, Luckily, the French culture and the English culture and certainly the French Canadian culture and the English Canadian culture is very, very similar. Okay. But if you have a whole area, say, let's say uh, Markslow in Germany, where you go there and every single flag on every single window and car is a Turkish flag, tough luck moving there, tough luck getting a job there, tough luck getting married or having friends there if you're not Turkish and you don't speak their language. And that goes for actually moving to French Quebec as well if you're an English speaker. It's not a cohesive culture. People aren't working together. I grew up in Vancouver 
And if I went into the Asian dominated areas, they'd sometimes, there are people that have assimilated and were within my own friend group and community. But for the most part, uh, when people can just go straight from China to a Chinese speaking community and not have to talk to anyone who's not Chinese, they're not going to bother. Why waste their time? They won't hire uh, white English speaking Canadians. In fact, they'll sometimes say, we don't serve your kind. Businesses have failed there because they refuse to serve uh, uh, white people. It's There is a, in fact, they have political meetings that are now in Chinese within communities in Vancouver. How are communities supposed to come together and engage and create business and create uh, a group identity, something cohesive that they want to be defended if they can't even have political meetings in the same language? We really have a lot of questions about what, like, who are we? Are we defined by religion? Are we defined by ethnicity? Are we defined by geography, by culture, by gender, by values? And these are questions that need to be answered, and our politicians are not letting us ask those. That's the biggest problem here. Okay. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't. I've identified a problem, and that problem is we don't know who we are, and there are a lot of disagreements between different tribes, and they aren't working together very well, certainly on a cultural basis. Uh, and when it comes to our politicians, when we say we need to have this discussion now, because 50 years from now, we're going to be dealing with Westerners potentially as a majority or, or as a minority. We're going to be dealing with English speakers in certain areas as a minority. And where are we going to go from there? Are we going to be speaking Chinese in British Columbia in 50 years? I want to know, should I be teaching my kids to speak Chinese? Our politicians look at us and they say, diversity is our strength. Diversity is our strength. That's all they say. Diversity is not a strength. We can see that in, in nature. We can see that anywhere. It's not a strength. Being cohesive and having a uh, homogenous society is always caused for more success, less crime. If you look at Japan, they have the least amount of crime uh, almost worldwide. The cops are having to investigate missing panties cases because they have nothing to do. Uh, it, this notion that our politicians should just tell us diversity is our strength and we should ignore it all. It's terrifying. At the very least, I don't have a solution, but at the very least, let smarter people than me have that conversation. Don't ban it. At least let our politicians discuss it publicly. At least put it on the table at universities where it's not allowed right now. Do you think, it's, uh, like some people say, that this is a conscious attempt by the left to kind of destroy these na uh, nations from within? Um, I can, so the way I see it, if, if we're going to get into kind of more conspiracy realm, is if we have no identity, if we have no cohesive national view of ourselves, then we are simply gray, tongueless, monotone people to be used as marks on a checkboard for businesses. We are simply... Uh, we, we should have no small governments. We should have no small communities and rules, and we could have a global government. Kind of like I think the European Union likes the idea of nationhood being undermined because they want to have more power as a larger government. Certainly in the United States, I, I think the federal government, at least the liberal left-wing federal government, likes the state's power undermined. They don't like uh, when Texans see themselves sure. as Texans who want to make their own laws and their own identity and their own story because that undermines the power of the federal government, right? So we, it's all about bringing your, your, your power and identity closer to home. I, I would much rather the people in my community be making laws for me than the people in Brussels, millions and millions of miles away, being making laws for me, right? But, here, that's, uh, but that's what I don't get. You live in Toronto. I live in New York. I mean, the amount of people who are in your literal community who think like you has to be astronomically small. And? No, I, I, so I, you're saying it's, it's still, I think they would make better decisions for, uh, tr I think Torontoites would make better decisions for Toronto than people who have never been here, that have never seen the community, that don't know what our problems okay. are. Torontoites are going to be far more capable of acknowledging and identifying what their issues are. now. It, Toronto is one of the most multicultural cities in the world, which is causing issues for it. It is causing uh, serious uh, issues on, on uh, ethnic grounds, religious grounds, and uh, political grounds, which has made it very, very strange. But look at, we just, you're saying people don't agree with me. Doug Ford just won the leadership of Toronto. Oh, He's I the right to be wing candidate. I wanted to be president uh, desperately. I know, I know. He's a hilarious guy. But you're saying people don't agree with me. They're, what, what usually happens is it tends to be a back and forth. 
um, it tends to be the liberals come in and they do crazy spending and they uh, they get to put in all of their policies, they get to put in all of their propaganda, all of their values, and then the conservatives, then they run out of money and suddenly people are tired of it. Why are we, uh, where are all these resources coming from? Our country, our provinces in tons of debt and then the conservatives get voted in and they never get a chance to put in their values they never get a, put in, a chance to put in their education systems to implement what they would like to do in the nation because they are spending their whole time in leadership cleaning up the mess they're spending it trying to pay off the debt they're spending it uh fixing the broken social systems that were introduced previously by the liberal government so what's happening is we're just constantly regressing as these liberal governments come in and implement their values and their progressive politics into our schools and the conservatives are right behind them trying to fix it as we're being pulled further and further and further left. And it's really sad. And, uh, but I think for the most part, if there were a, a balanced amount of information being put out there, if there were a balanced amount of government propaganda from the left and the right, I, I really do think uh, there would be far more people that agree. I don't, it actually it's not think, I know for a fact far more people would agree with me because most people don't pay attention to politics. Most people just get their propaganda and move on. Right. So we're, we're running out of time and there's one, th I, I can't believe we haven't even got to your documentary. So you went to South Africa, <laughs> farm, the documentary is called Farmlands. And this is a huge kind of issue that I think people in the Western press don't really know how to frame. Because yeah. for, for decades, understandably, uh, apartheid South Africa was held on the world stage as an example of this is what we cannot have. Uh, there was enormous pressure internationally to end the apartheid regime, which was done relatively peacefully, which could have been happened in a, it could have gone down much worse uh, than the, way mm -hmm. the, the, the transition of power. Uh, but now it seems in a sense, the chickens have come home to roost. Uh, tell me what, what this documentary is about and what you saw when you went there. Yeah, so of course, and I think reasonably so, after apartheid, there was a lot of animus, uh, animosity and anger towards the white population. Now people have a lot of trouble kind of focusing their anger on who actually brought in policies, who actually did things, and unfortunately people tend to just apply it to white people in general or black people in general did this, right? And, and it's, uh, sometimes for political purposes, you do have to think on broader terms, but the animosity towards the white population has been growing since the end of apartheid. And as the power of the African National Cong Congress has been more and more cemented, uh, the, the laws and the actions towards the white population have only gotten scarier and scarier. So it started with these farmers where people would commit crimes against farmers and a lot of the farming population are the historic poor white farmers they would commit crimes but it wouldn't just be a crime to get money it wouldn't just be a crime to steal their car or to steal their their weapons or money in a safe they would also torture these families because in the news media they had heard white people are responsible for your oppression in the media they had heard white people own most of the resources you should hate them you should want their resources in the media and from the government they had heard it is the, the shoot kill the boar in fact the eff the uh, the uh, economic freedom fighters who have 10 percent of the vote in south africa they sing a largely popular anti-apartheid song on their stages all the time singing shoot kill the boar shoot kill the boar so with all of this propaganda uh, in let's the explain air, to people who the, of, wait let's explain to people who the boar are it's not wild pigs no oh, yeah the boar people are a the settlers of the the ancestors or sorry descendants of dutch settlers uh who came hundreds and hundreds of years ago to south africa with a company called the dutch east india company and they have lived there for hundreds of years they've been uh they've fought wars there, they've had their land stolen from them, they've purchased land. It's not a very simple story of colonization like many countries. A lot of the Boer people were indentured servants of the Dutch East India Company and just found themselves in South Africa and ended up fleeing their mi midland and buying land from the African tribes. So they were kind of stuck there. They didn't come there and steal the land. It wasn't a uh, colonization story like many other places. And they've just ended up being a farming group in South Africa. And because of the introduction of apartheid actually by the British, not by the, the Boer, uh, when they came in in the oh, I'm not gonna, 1800s, maybe uh, they they brought an apartheid and the government. It, it's caused an animosity towards all white people in South Africa, even the white people who have no responsibility for apartheid, no connections to it, and that has manifested itself in mass 
crime and murder against this white population. Some of the most horrific crimes you have ever heard of. Kids being boiled in bathtubs, people being raped for days. Uh, I spoke to a man whose mother's eyes were gouged out with, um, with forks. And just the stories you hear on these farms, because they're in the middle of nowhere, they're so remote and people can take them and uh, torture people for days there. It's like stuff out of horror movies. And no one was reporting on it. No one was reporting on this story in the mainstream media because it's white people and it's South Africa. And South Africa was for so long what people told us was going to be the rainbow nation. They said this is going to be the epitome of progress, the epitome of racial peace, and the epitome of socialism working. And what ended up happening instead is we are at a point where the government has decided they are going to take white land without compensation, just steal it. They have fired whites from their jobs simply because of their skin color and said, in fact, you can only have a, a amount of white workers comparable to that of the population. So you can only hire 8% white workers for your company. The majority has to be black workers. And uh, on the ground, farmers are being tortured and killed and they're attempting to drive them out of the country. Tens of thousands of white farmers are leaving every single year now because they're just trying to escape the place. In fact, countries are considering offering them refugee status because of the land seizures that are going on. And these stories are ignored because we are not used to, we, we do not have, know in a Western mindset how to see white people as the victim. We don't know how to do it and our media doesn't know how to do it. They've spent so long saying white people can never be oppressed. They are always the privileged one that these people's story stories have been completely ignored. So I went there, I went on the ground, I spoke to them, I found out their stories, and I published it all in a an hour-long documentary called Farmlands on my YouTube channel. So would you be in favor of uh, if they don't they don't speak English, they speak Afrikaans, right? Uh, they, they speak, speak English as well for the most uh, part. Most part, okay. So would you be in favor of yeah. kind of mass migration of these South African farmers? Well, the thing is, actually, so they just had 150, maybe, I think 150, it could be 15,000 uh, farmers moved to Russia, and the Russians welcomed them with open arms, because these people, while they still have time to learn Russian, they still have to work on their language skills, they're bringing their own money, they have a skill, they're not going on welfare, they, uh, for the most part, are easily assimilated into the culture they're from although eurasian culture is a little different they're still from western descent so it's quite close uh they're welcoming welcoming them with open arms i think that of anyone the boer people would be a far better migrant than someone from uh like syria i just well they're both in refugee situations they're both in situations where they they're being driven out of their country by by their governments uh, if we're going to choose, if we only have a limited amount, why not accept refugees that are going to be beneficial to your nation? Our governments are supposed to serve the people. Our governments are supposed to think what's best for Canadians. So why are we allowing immigration, certainly non-refugee immigration as well, that is not good for the people, that is not good for the, for the people that are actually paying the taxes and making this nation work, that have a social contract for what their culture and society is going to be like. Uh, and I think if, if a country is considering bringing in migration and uh, refugees, bring in people that are going to be better for your culture and are going to contribute to it, and the poor are a far better pick than many, many other groups that are being brought over at the moment. Okay, I'm going to leave you with the obvious question, which I'm sure you've gotten many times, which is almost a trope at this point, uh, which is, aren't you saying, if it was 100 years ago, wouldn't you be saying we shouldn't have Irish, Italian, and Eastern European immigration to America and Canada? And hasn't that shown that these same arguments, you know, long term don't actually apply? We didn't have the same welfare systems then. I mean, you look at, uh, it's actually quite funny, I, I, maybe I'll tweet at you the statistics around this, but if you look at the immigration that was happening in the early, like 100 years ago, the, uh, the amount of people on welfare was like, the people that were going on welfare was close to zero. We didn't have people that were committing mass, mass amounts of crime when they came in. The industriousness and the jobs available were far different. Uh, it, when people say that, that argument it, it makes no sense to me it makes no sense to me though they also so another argument i hear from libertarians actually is mass immigration 100 years ago during the time of the irish and italians coming over industry was booming uh there was a mass amount of migrants contributing to the economy 
that has completely reversed since we started taking in mass amounts of North African and Middle Eastern migrants who do not assimilate to the culture. Now, this is a big thing. They have no respect for the culture. If you come into this country and you have no respect for the other people because they aren't your community, right. uh, you're not going to care to take from it. You're not going to care if you make a mess of the streets. You're not going to care who's if you go on the dole. Before, it was a very respect-based culture where it's like, you don't want to be on the dole because this is your community. These are your your Christian Western neighbors that you want to, you want to protect. You don't want to take from them. Uh, but if someone who maybe even hates the West comes in, why wouldn't you take it for all it's got? Why wouldn't you just, you know, like go on all the social welfare you can, all of the subsidized housing, all of the uh, minority scholarship funds you can, just take it for everything it's got. And that's what's happening. Our nations are being raped by people who don't respect the culture, who don't respect the laws, and who don't respect uh, that we have a debt crisis and we can't just be giving out money willy nilly. But they don't care. They don't care about the future of these nations. But, in, in, but I mean, in all seriousness, though, like o over 100 years ago, the Irish and Italians certainly brought gangs with them and crime with them. I mean, the, the mafia sure. is with us to this day. Sure. And maybe, maybe they should have been more careful with that kind of immigration. <laughs> I don't like I maybe yeah maybe they should have blocked them sure okay. they may have assimilated but the Irish and Italian cultures are still a lot more similar to they, they're still a lot more similar to western culture sure. yeah there are going to be I mean, and culture is a great quote where people asked her oh so you just want to block non-white people and she's like no I don't think we should have too many Russians either <laughs> like it's there's well, it's it's not on a racial well, basis I there take that personal I take that personal. <laughs> I take that personal. I'm going to take that up with her next time I see her. Uh, Lauren, a good, a good go indicator. Ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, finish. A good finish indicator there, sometimes of, of cultural culture is is going to be race at times. Like you can have an assumption. You could be wrong, but you can have an assumption if someone is is uh, white. Oh, maybe you're from from Europe. Maybe you grew up in a Western household. You could be completely wrong and find out that they grew up in a Muslim country and they're completely Muslim. But uh, it, it tends to be just a group identifier strategy that works at times okay just because we grew up in different nations lauren southern my yeah. most notorious guest uh <laughs> hopefully i'll get to meet you at some point if i'm ever in canada say hi to molly for me uh I absolutely was, uh, and have good luck in australia have you been to australia before no i have not uh, but i think i'll need the luck <laughs> so i appreciate yeah, it yeah <laughs> are you are you at a position where you're going to be able to like sightsee um We'll see. I, I might be in a little too much trouble right now with the public, but uh, I'll try. I'll do my best. Just put on a MAGA <laughs> baseball cap and you'll fit in right. It'll be Oh, fine. that'll do great. Yeah. yeah. And, and some sunglasses. <laughs> it'll, it'll be absolutely fine. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren Southern. Uh, and thank you all. I will see you next week. You are welcome. What's the